Okay, so I have Anderson Todd here with me this morning. He's the Assistant Director of Consciousness and Wisdom Lab at the University of Toronto. He teaches interdisciplinary classes in cognitive science and union theory. He's also a practicing, practicing union psychoanalyst. Um, so yeah, Anderson, we'll see how we can do this. I thought maybe we could start with talking about some of the metaphysical implications of synchronicity and Jung. So we'll probably confine ourselves mostly to later Jung, because I know you make that distinction when you talk about him, because again, 50 years of work, his savoir is kind of hard to parse. <laughs> He's uh, not a very systematic. No, no. I mean, he, um, I think, in, frankly, in some positive ways, but he tends to favor completeness over consistency. And so yeah. definitely, uh, and uh, it seems that as time goes on, he becomes mm, maybe less concerned with the feathers that he'd be ruffling by making unconventional claims so okay late young good yeah uh, and it's nice to be here by the by yeah yeah thank you so much it's gonna be a good time i hope hmm. um okay so uh did you did you want to jump in and kind of introduce the stuff around this or do you want me to take it um i can do a little bit so pretty much as far as i understand it uh young in his later life he, he becomes pretty liberal talking about synchronicity and some of the uh perhaps some of the things it might purport um, as far as the unis mundus and talking about kind of matter as being a coagulation of psyche and perhaps even sort of a marginal uh, projection of the collective unconscious. And basically we're always moving through psyche and that mm -hmm. spirit is, you know, the more arid, it's the father principle. It's going to, uh, <clears throat> so that we're kind of always locked in that his epistemology is very Kantian, obviously. So for him, it's not a problem that we're always within psyche because externality and internality are likewise psychic. Um, mm. But the implications of synchronicity, especially for our kind of implicit naturalistic framework that we move through is kind of, kind of interesting. It's like placebo. We don't really know what to do with it. Seems mm -hmm. to have something to do with, um, emanation and the kind of the meeting of meaning and potentiality in the actionable world where we can move and have interactions with other people obviously synchronicity sometimes involves other conscious agents so that's kind of strange too it basically has like an ecclesial um all sorts of like quantum implications it's very strange so <laughs> i'll leave it to you now since i right yeah, it's definitely strange. So, I mean, um, Jung has a, a, a pretty long-standing interest in sort of um, the anomalous. So, you know, he's, it's very much when Freud says, you know, we have to protect uh, psychoanalysis and sort of build a bulwark against the black tide of the occult. Part of what he has in mind is kind of Jung's ongoing fascination with, you know, um, mediumistic experiences, um, uh, parapsychology, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, he has that, that longstanding interest in those um, kinds of phenomena. Uh, on top of that, you know, from the standpoint of kind of the historical progression of ideas, it's worthwhile situating this in the mid 20th century when parapsychology had um, taken on a degree of credibility that it since, um, you know, has never really quite recaptured. So the work of J.B. Ryan, uh, especially at Duke University, um, Ryan had been doing a lot of work in and around uh, psychokinesis, right, and predictive stuff. So, you know, when we think of the kind of classic um, set of, uh, you know, star wavy line square, right, predictive ESP cards, uh, mm -hmm. and doing sort of um, uh, PK tests of various kinds, psychokinesis tests, where you were attempting to roll you know, dice or, you know, have tumblers of dice. So much work had been done in and around that by Ryan that seemed to be putting things on a reasonable footing. And so it sort of stretched the Overton window of intellectual conversation a bit. There were obviously always people who were opposed to it, but it opened some of that up. Um, on top of that, obviously, you know, from the early 20th century, we do have some of the you know, strikingly weird uh, findings at the time of science. So in particular, we get uh, relativity and quantum, right? So Einsteinian and, and quantum. And the implications of quantum, especially in its early interpretations, right, seemed to open 
Right. So some of the implications of, of quantum in particular, especially in some of its earlier interpretations, you know, we were showing things like waveform collapse and so on and so forth. And there we have the emergence of the Copenhagen interpretation. And under the Copenhagen interpretation, the idea is that the collapse of the waveform is related to, um, you know, the presence of an observer. Now, it's important to note that more current, you know, sort of understandings and formulations of quantum do not think of the observer in the same way. So we've ended up with a sort of folk understanding of um, quantum mechanics that is not really reflective of the cutting edge that has removed. So, um, you know, so all of that was sort of in the air in a certain sense, right? And um, against that, we have the general backdrop of the sort of post-Cartesian severance of mind and matter. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, th this was it, it wasn't a totally new idea, but post Descartes, obviously, this kind of dualistic divide and answering the questions about a seeming fundamental incompatibility between these two different domains of experience, right, remained a massive outstanding and remains, right, a massive outstanding yeah. problem. So into that, you know, Jung begins to observe, you know, certain kinds of experiences, both personally and clinically, in which and his categorization is pretty broad here, but the, the ones that we're really concerned with mostly are the kind of meaningful coincidence types where people experience a run of events of some kind, which meaningfully emotionally relates to and seems to symbolically elucidate um, you know, events, blockages, or preoccupations that they're experiencing, right, in a way that um, signifies in some way. So the classic version of this is Jung is sitting with uh, an analyst hand in his office. This is a woman who is very much locked into a, a kind of analytical rationalist framework um, and really unable to sort of make contact with the irrational material that she needs to make contact with in order to sort of break outside of her um, complexes and framings. And, you know, she's very much stuck in this mode and she comes in with a dream, something of a big dream, which has obviously had a big impact on her where she's dreamed of uh, a, a, a receiving a brooch, right? Like an Egyptian scarab brooch, mm -hmm. a sort of jeweled brooch. And as he reports it, uh, you know, in the midst of this session, she's describing this and is quite perplexed because the symbol seems very opaque to her. Uh, and he hears this, you know, the tappy tap tap on his window. And so when he goes and opens the window, he sees a, uh, a rose chafer, which is a kind of scarabade beetle, not especially common, frankly, in Switzerland, but you know, they, they do appear there and kind of rose chafer. So this tapping at the window um, happens and he goes to the window, he opens the window and in flies a, a common rose chafer, which is kind of scarabade beetle, which he captures out of the air and he goes and he sort of offers this to the woman and says, here is your scarab. And the effect that this has um, is quite profound. It breaks through her kind of rational lock in a certain way. And you know, from that, we see a sort of a model. He talks about the synchronicities that he experiences in his own life and uh, synchronicities as they occur clinically. Okay, so the idea with synchronicity in this sense, right, it, you know, leaving aside for a second the sort of more um, abstruse parapsychological notions, what we get in a meaningful coincidence is that it in some way is representing a breakthrough that indicates um, a sort of a hidden affinity or a hidden structure behind the apparent structure of experience, right? Mm -hmm. And when he um, unpacks this idea with Wolfgang Pauli, uh, who was a prominent um, uh, quantum uh, theorist, uh, quantum physicist, you know, Pauli is interested in a number of these sort of unusual properties um, in and around quantum and the implications of the sort of interchangeability of energy and matter, but also of the a-causal properties that are present or at least implied in early versions of quantum. That normally we think of the naturalistic world as being fully determined by, uh, by deterministic causal properties, right? So mm -hmm. we still think about things in sort of Newtonian terms, right? The billiard ball model where event A leads to event B, event B leads to event C, and it's like a collision of things with an explicable back path. But A-causality opens up the potential for um, things which are occurring and influencing each other, not through those kinds of standard Newtonian causal means, right? Things coordinating uh, what Einstein famously disliked and called spooky action at a distance. <laughs> so 
you know, where Einstein disliked it, um, you know, Pauli took it to be a given and indeed in a sort of an important feature of reality that would need to be grappled with. And that actually is something that, if anything, has been reinforced in more recent versions of quantum. So, yeah. you know, post um, sort of Bell inequality experiments and uh, some of the early work in the 90s of uh, physicist uh, Alain Aspect, who has a terrific name for this kind of thing, um, they put uh, a causality on basically sort of theory independent footing in a way, um, no matter what your formulation is of fundamental physics, even when we sort of exceed current versions of quantum, you're going to have to deal with a causality. So at the time, however, you know, they were looking at this in a hypothetical way, and Pauli was deeply involved in his own depth psychological work and his own dream analysis. And when the two of them began to kind of knock this back and forth, the idea was trying to find some kind of unifying idea that would be able to bind together these questions of the seeming interaction of mind and matter in ways that were not immediately causally explicable, together with some of the notions that seem to be emerging in the tool set of quantum. And what they come up with is synchronicity. So with synchronicity, the Jungian notion of the archetype sort of shifts its metaphysical positioning. Prior to that, there were lots of cases where Jung took a much more sort of orthodox and less controversial explanatory uh, tack to all of this. And, you know, would sort of explain it as the, you know, the psychic end of the spectrum of reflexes. So if the physical end is I hit your hammer with a knee and your leg kicks, right? The, uh, the archetype ends up taking up the other, the other end of that spectrum. It's like the psychological version of reflex and of pattern and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And a lot of the time when I teach it, actually, that's where I introduce it. So I talk about things like um, the imprinting phase in newly hatched birds. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah. like, right. So, you know, when geese hatch, whatever happens to be there during the imprinting window, uh, they will orient towards uh, as though it is the mother. And most frequently it is the mother. So from an evolutionary perspective, that works out quite well. But mm -hmm. you can, of course, have them imprint on the experimenter or a glove or a sock puppet or a ping pong ball or any other thing, at which point they will all toddle after that object in a cute line, right? Like ducks in the park or geese, <laughs> goslings in the park. So, you know, that's sort of one view of things and it's a palatable one. But the synchronistic idea takes this into a far more metaphysically bold territory. Um, because what it basically says is like, okay, if we take synchronicities at face value, so if we sort of step aside from all of the various um, statistical means that we normally use to debunk these experiences, and, and those things are important by the by, right? Just because you were thinking about somebody before you picked up the phone, doesn't it, when they call you, doesn't mean you know, that that's uh, a massive significance. If right. you happen to see the number four everywhere, you know, this may in part be explained by the fact that it's among the, you know, the base 10 numerals. So yeah. know, it's going to turn up, right? And of course, there's selection effects that kick in. When you become aware of something, often it is the case that it will pick out of the environment because of its novelty. Right, salience. Yeah. Sure. But then there are the weird ones. And there are, you know, plenty of sort of instances of this. You can go through kind of the historical curio file and find all of these cases of like truly weird right, um, pileups of facts and things. The Scarabay Beetle is kind of an interesting example of that because it shows a bunch of the key features that Jung is fascinated with. We have somebody who's in a state of emotional lock, right? So there's a state of sort of emotional deadlock where they can't break through rationally speaking and they get sort of an enormous pressure of emotion. That kind of emotional pressure is a very common feature mm -hmm. in uh, synchronicity reports, uh, at which point we see something in a sense manifest, if we, if we take this at sort of Jung's face value, manifest simultaneously within mental space and physical space, right? So there are sort of versions of it. The woman has the dream which pushes in, but then that is also reflected in a physical event, which is basically almost impossible to sort of find a normal causal linkage. Like yeah. trying to trying to create a normal causal linkage between those two things is, you know, it strains right. it stra it so strains the back, imagination. Yeah. yeah, right. So so the idea here then is okay, 
So there are a few sort of potential explanations. You could say, you know, the mental is impressing itself on the physical. You could say that the physical is sort of retro impressing itself on the mental, mental or something. But Jung instead settles on the conclusion that the apparent distinction of the physical and the mental uh, is in some sense illusory, and that both are in fact uh, emanations or shadows, right, limited aspects of a unitive reality, which is mm -hmm. above that, uh, which he calls the unus mundus. And that's an idea with a pretty old philosophical pedigree right. and it turns yeah. up in lots of right, mystical settings. So, you know, the idea here then um, elevates the position of the archetype considerably because as he sort of proceeds through this, the archetype stops being a biological reflex and starts being the organizing principle of reality itself, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, it, it approaches, without him actually saying it, quite close to them being, essentially speaking, gods, yeah. right? That are, that are informing the nature of, uh, of reality. Um, yeah. And there is also, of course, a sort of a, a utilitarian or clinical aspect to these sorts of events, which is that they do tend to have this kind of breakthrough effect um, where because it's so shocking and the mind sort of seizes onto it, it seems to sort of hint at a hidden structure or a hidden meaning or a hidden purpose, right? Um, as I often describe it to people, it's, uh, it's a bit like getting a wink from Mercurius, mm -hmm. right? you, I don't think you can ultimately generally tease it apart. Like, you know, when you try to sort of dig in on it, um, at some level, it, it is elusive, but you also can't shake it easily. Um, yeah. it's, it really sticks with you in a kind of, um, and I'm using yeah. this, this term literally ominous, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. so that, that marks a pretty significant transition uh, in his thinking around this stuff that I think probably was sort of boiling for quite some time. Um, but when he sort of formalizes it in those terms, uh, we start moving into uh, a much kind of bolder and far less orthodox phase of his, you know, ontology as he's constructing it. Right, yeah. And it seems to kind of link into sort of the talos of individuation at the same time. Marie-Louis von Franz has a story saying about a village that's been in drought for two years or something like that. I think Richard Wilhelm is there for some reason. Anyway, they call in a rainmaker and he sits outside the village for three days and after three days it rains. So Richard Wilhelm goes and talks to him and he asks the guy, what did you do? And he says something to the effect of, oh, I just put myself in order and then naturally it rained. So that's kind of, and we see that with stories of the saints too, where, um, you know, the landscape around them will become fragrant and things of that nature. And it's sort of, <clears throat> I don't know, I think with individuation, when we talk about kind of assuming a greater scope of consciousness and becoming in a sense more ontologically free in that way, then we're actually incorporating the objective to uh, the external objective. Yeah, anyway. I mean, the, the individuation track is always, I mean, it, that's a, it's a slippery eel conceptually, partly because mm -hmm. it is highly individual, despite, you know, the sort of fragmentary roadmaps we like to use. Um, but, but I mean, there is something to it. You can see it also, um, those two aspects, I think, really clearly in things like Grail Myth. So, yeah. you know, in, in Grail Myth, you know, you have these things where uh, the king is wounded, so the land is sick. Mm -hmm. And this, this idea of the continuity, in some sense, of the, uh, the, the world and the health of the individual in this microcosm, macrocosm way plays out there. But then that, ultimately speaking, is also tied to the pursuit of the grail, trying yeah. to move towards this kind of ultimate principle in some way, shape, or form, uh, and people sort of questing for it. So I think you see those ties quite often um and very often it's the case that synchronicities you know for people who are interested in them and pay attention to them they often signpost moments of alignment yeah um you know my metaphysical standing on them i try to hold my metaphysics very very lightly so i don't commit to a particular interpretation because i don't think i have enough information to make that kind of 
uh, <laughs> to make that kind of decision, you know? Um, that said, uh, because I have that kind of openness, it is certainly the case that I have experienced a number of synchronicities in my life that even sort of using my, you know, rational machinery to try to like pluck out all of my biases and to acknowledge the sampling issues and to, right, there, there is this sort of um, unanswerable residuum that is left that just seems so weird uh, and so striking and so particular, right? So aligned in a certain way that, you know, you're left with saying basically like, what are the odds? What are the odds? And it turns out those things are not, in my experience, all that uncommon. No. Um, again, you know, when I talk to people about it, people are often cagey about talking about it and kind of embarrassed. But when yeah. they get into it, you'll find that those things are turning up for people. Yeah. So in those cases, I think the natural tendency is to look at them and to try to sort of play junior detective. Mm -hmm. And that I think is only, it, it, that only gets you so far. It has a limited utility. If you come at it and you try to sort of decode it and decode it and decode it, I, it, I think it eventually sort of starts to fall apart like a loaf of wet bread in your hands. Right. But if you, tr if you treat it instead as sort of um, this question of alignment, like I am in alignment with things in some particular way, um, or this has shifted me into alignment in a particular way, right? Very much like the, the rainmaker, right? Get, you know, now I am sorted. So if you take it as a marker that you're in a particular kind of channel, then I think it's useful. You know, it's a sort of like signpost, you know, keep doing kind of what you're doing, right? Rather than what does this mean? Let's chase it down and solve the case and crack yeah. the handle. Yeah. So C.S. Lewis kind of talks about this in his book, Miracles that in a sense, the new, the new Testament miracles are actually more endemic of like the true creation than is kind of the apparent normalcy. Mm -hmm. So when we have kind of synchronicities where an internal order manifests itself in kind of the coherence and intelligibility of externality, and when those two things co-align, it's actually indicative of something being more ontologically real than otherwise. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of, interesting we don't usually think of it like that we try to think of it as an exception rather than like right now i'm going the right way right yeah yeah i mean it's sort of you can shift around in your thinking about it and play with it that way like it's an exception to have an immediate connection between mind and matter provided that you ignore the immediate connection between mind and matter that you experience every day but have no good explanation for. right yeah right you know the the fact is that the hard problem in philosophy of mind is, I mean, it's caused, called the hard problem for a reason. Like it really is a doozy. And, uh, you know, I, and I've done some work on this and I still think it's a doozy and possibly, it may possibly be sort of fundamentally insoluble. Um, I, I, I don't know, but you know, the jury sort of isn't, uh, isn't in, the jury is still out. out. The jury is still jury out. Is, yeah. yeah. Jury is yeah. out if they haven't made a decision, right? That's yes. one of those ones like on the bandwagon, off the bandwagon. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, clearly the, there are like connections and some people will say there's actually nothing controversial about this. I, I would tend to say that that is sort of limiting the scope of the, of the question. Like there really is a deep question about what the connection between these two domains is. It's not by any stretch resolved. Um, if you take that into consideration, then, well, synchronicity is not that weird, right? I mean, it's sort of weird because people think like, well, my mind is in my brain and my brain's in my body and that's how it moves my body. Right. And it's like, yeah, is your mind in your body? Like, mm -hmm. what does that right. mean? <laughs> no, maybe not. Like, we don't know is the answer. Right. And so it's, you know, it's only sort of a weird anomaly if you take it from that perspective, your sort of everyday perspective. Um, now, you know, in a different way, obviously, it is a, a deeply, deeply strange, right? And it, you know, there's a reason it gets sort of lumped in around parapsychology, because it, people tend to read it as being a kind of influence of the mind on the world in a non-natural way. Yeah, like placebo, I, but it's like kind of, yeah, it creates like yeah. this weird, it's not an explanation at all. <laughs> Right. And, and I mean, placebo, which I've talked about too, and I, I have a friend, um, uh, Jay Olson, who 
does work around placebo. And I wish there was more good work. He does great work uh, around placebo. Uh, placebo is peculiar to me because um, you know, it's sufficiently well established that it's the gold standard against which other interventions are measured. But at the same time, there is a deep spookiness that most people experience with the idea. Right? Mm -hmm. And typically we try to sort of offside it. Right? We don't emphasize or amplify placebo. We need placebo to move to a simply explicable physical cause. Now, in some ways, again, it's like, what's weird about placebo? Like your mind is theoretically affecting your body all the time. Like, I'm going to raise my arm. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, but, but there's something about it that, that weirds us out. Like it operates in a way that is unexpected to us. And so, you know, similarly, synchronicity, I think, is in that space. Uh, to me, one of the things that, you know, I don't think it's a closed question, but so people very often react to synchronicity uh, negatively because the, because of the perception that it is in some sense a causal. And I find that objection deeply, deeply strange because a causality is just an established fact now. Right. It's, you know, and people would be like, well, we don't know if it's operating here. And it's like, okay, but once you've established any instance of a principle, that's sufficient that you could theoretically propose it as a mechanism by which something is working. Mm -hmm. A causality is in. So at that point, the idea that there might be a causal influences operating within a domain that we do not understand to structure things, you know, wh why not? Um, right. And people will be like, well, that's, it violates naturalism. It's like, yes, but we don't understand. Like we don't actually have a theory here. So what is it that we're violating? Right. Right. We're violating a bunch of conceptions of some, you know, of some domain, right. The physical and granted we've had good luck there, but it's not exactly as though we have a completely locked up account of yeah. how things function. So I find that objection a very, very strange one yeah. personally. Yeah. The folk conception is usually more concrete. It's less differentiated, and it usually keeps its back way back into kind of the more erudite um, arena, I think. Because, yeah, it, things are really pretty nebulous, just largely. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, most of the time, I've heard you talk about this certitude and epistemological humility is something that's necessary. Um, so yeah, we can maybe talk about, I remember marie Levy from France also would talk about things like the unreasonable effectiveness of, of number and mathematics and things like that. And I've mm -hmm. heard you talk about the doctrine of signatures. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of, those are both things that are psychic and yet their kind of semiotic chain is linked with some sort of intelligibility in the external world. So they're just mm -hmm. like two more kind of branches through which we can see synchronicity operating. So maybe we can move into talking a little bit about complexes and hyperobjects, mm -hmm. archetypes and things like this. Again, I don't know how to deploy these topics effectively. They're so massive, but we can try. Um, so what do you think is the, the relationship is between a complex, something psychoidal uh, and somewhat autonomous and a hyper object, something more like global warming, something ecological, and mm -hmm. people would say mostly external, because in a certain sense, we weren't really aware of global warming until we had the instruments to identify it. But at the mm -hmm. same time, it's still embodied in networks of things that are actually more complex than global warming probably is. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, Timothy Morton talks about like the subsense, subsendence of complexity within the human mind or something like that. So like ecology actually incorporates things that are in gestalt going to be less. Am I saying this correctly? Less complicated, more complicated. I don't know. Um, the human mind is obviously going to subsend the complexity of ecology roughly, but we still need the instruments developed by the human mind to kind of model ecology. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So that's a big question. So the, yeah. the, you know, the complex to archetype to psychoidal, I mean, you know, the, <laughs> the kind of conventional view of this to me is it's a pretty simple threefold thing. You know, the archetype is the Kantian thing in itself. And so it stands outside intelligibility, right? We, right. Can't, we can't fit it into our head, period. Um, accumulating around the archetype, right, are the sort of cultural 
um, the, the sort of bits of cultural things that are pulled into its pattern, pulled into its field, right? That accumulate around it and we get sort of the archetypal image. Uh, and then from some conjunction of that archetypal image and our personal experience and our personal background, we construct the complex. And the complex in a sense is, um, you know, our interface point in the direction of that um, sort of psychic principle um, or psychoid principle. Uh, but, and, and so there's complexes sort of in every direction that there is an archetypal force. The thing yeah. is that normally they're um, innocuous, they're transparent. We tend to notice them when they're a pain in the ass. Right. So kind of the opacity is when it's obstructed. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, you know, like, um, you know, you can think about this in terms of sort of general mechanisms of agency. We notice things when they resist us for the most part. So if you attempt to move your arm and it doesn't move, right, that's going to get your attention. Yeah. If you attempt to move your arm and it does, you're not going to notice it at all. You're going to completely transparently deploy it, right, for affordances, yada, yada, yada. When you wake up from a nap and your arm is asleep <laughs> and you've got to move it, right? Yeah. So, and if your arm suddenly goes off on its own and starts trying to choke you, you're really going to notice. So that's very much the space that complexes operate in. For the most part, we operate through them transparently. We don't think about it because they are, right? They're just integrated tightly with us and with our sense of things and our sense of action. And we just work with them. But when they either are non-responsive or they are opaque to us, or they're operating in a sufficiently kind of difficult quasi-autonomous fashion that they're tripping us up or getting in our way in various ways, then we notice them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, typically speaking, when we're talking about complexes, the way that I express this is like, it's only a problem if it's a problem, but problems are what you tend to focus. Right. On, right. Always. Yeah. So, you know, when we scale that up to the psychoid, I mean, you know, that again, opens up sort of big, it opens up a great big metaphysical can of worms. Mm. Um, but you know, I don't know that you necessarily, unless you're sort of interfacing with this stuff in a kind of spiritual way, it's right. not typically relevant to your usual operation. Yeah. And Jung's own point specifically around sort of the interface with the self uh, is that a kind of principled agnosticism is, you know, the only rational position, but that it doesn't matter because you have to engage these things anyway, if you want mm -hmm. to be functional. So, so the ultimate kind of question of the metaphysics around the psychoid is less important in some sense when you're actually doing the work. Yeah. Because you still have to speak to them in symbols. You still have to use ritual. You still have to make contact with these things and they behave like they are these, you know, larger than life entities. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, that's, I, you know, I'm an explicitly religious person. Um, so I, I treat them as if they were they were autonomous and, and self-existent. But mm -hmm. I think partly I'm trying to make a case for higher minds and things like the saints adopting adopting whole areas of potentiality and kind of being their their principle. Mm -hmm. um, the GC Tempest wrote an interesting book trying to reconcile Saint Maximus Confessor and Jung. <laughs> It was very dense. Um, I'm not sure I That's totally understood I it. I haven't read that one. Can you give me the gist? Yeah. Basically, he makes the case that Jung is actually pretty, like we can collude with Jung insofar as, or I guess up to the point where he says that it's ontologically impossible to have direct experience of the archetypes. Um, whereas as Orthodox, we would, or Orthodox would say, that it is possible if you mm. achieve ontological likeness. That's why we can have positive revelation of the nature of God as Trinitarian rather right. than just a complete apophatic agnosticism. So, I th but we, we would explain things like higher minds sort of in the same way that we explain the fact that we can be composed of disparate units that are apparently um, not endowed with psychic capability especially metacognitive right. capability yeah and that we're, there's we're not emanation. we're not singular we're not singular unit of beings no right yeah and to right. a certain degree the our constituent parts might even have sort of maybe not metacognitive but some sort of consciousness um but then there's an emanation of some sort of principle that meets with the parts 
So even if we have something like a hyper object, I don't know, and we can use Santa or something. That's a fun one that people do nowadays. Um, that maybe I haven't thought about Santa as a hyper object. Okay, go. <laughs> well, um, capitalism, whatever. Um, to a certain extent, it's it was always pre-existent, and but when once the parts were there there's an emanation of identity that comes down and that might have some i don't know this is hard to talk about with, <laughs> but it might achieve some sort of consciousness some sort of directedness in the same way that we have kind of a meeting and a total interpenetration of the emanation and the emergence um but there seems to be some sort of line in jung that can lead us there if we wanted to again try to be fair to Jung and leave his work as it is but mm -hmm. I'm interested in doing this for my own sake sort of so mm -hmm. I don't know what do you think um, about that well okay so so you know like I said my my basic position is you know is um I really work very hard to hold things lightly not right. to take in fact, particular positions, mostly because I, uh, well, as, as you mentioned, right, I'm deeply distrustful of certainty. No, um, yeah. And, uh, and I have had lots of experiences, many of them contradictory, that presented themselves with enormous amounts of authority. And I can, you know, obviously sort of step back from that and say, well, you know, with my limited perspective, it's impossible for me to you know, since the, so I can sort of speculate in a sense, right? I yeah. can get dialectically speculative about it. I mean, that's and, what I'm doing too, so. <laughs> sure, of course. I mean, it's what we're all doing, right? Right, yeah, And, yeah. you know, the, so when I think about, when I think about the idea, okay, is it possible, you know, through sort of some movement of our essence or something to bring ourselves in alignment with an ultimate metaphysical principle in a way that gives us direct access to it? You know, I think about that and it's like, sure, okay, maybe. <laughs> right like like maybe that's yeah. true um but i don't know how i would establish it no right so this is the kicker um it's like i'm not foreclosing that con I'm not foreclosing that possibility it's just that when i consider it it's like okay so if that were the case how would i how would i establish it it can't yeah. just hinge on certainty like it can't hinge on that i suppose there could be a kind of gnostic form of transformation which impresses itself upon me so thoroughly that I possess a deeper form of knowledge than merely rationally defined knowledge and so on and right. so forth. But, but like, if that happened to me, how would I know that that wasn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. So there, there's like a skeptical thread that runs for me that is sort of like, if the sky tears open and God's bearded face pushes through and says, I am here, my children, whatever, that's not going to result in anything for anybody you know, a third of the human population will go see, uh, another third will go, the government is putting LSD in our drinking water. And another third will say aliens. And yeah. like, so, you know, the, there is no, there's no way yeah. to interpret it. Right. For, yeah. For me, yeah. it's trust in persons and it's right in a certain sense. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now again, that's not to say that I'm foreclosing it. Like I'm using yeah, language no, here that yeah, I'm using language that sounds like it's akin to the kind of like new atheist skeptical perspective. And I frankly couldn't no, I, be farther away from I that. I hear you, yeah. Um, so, the, but the thing is that whether or not it's an ultimate metaphysical principle, and, and I do see some signs that it might be, to be fair. Synchronicity is in that category. Like there are things in synchronicity that make it awfully hard to think of this as just being some kind of brain event yeah you know? <laughs> well all and, sorts of things yeah yeah um that, yeah all sorts of things and it's not just it's not just sort of manifest synchronicities in the world it's certain kinds of dreams uh, unusual sorts of dreams that happen that um you know i've had instances i had one instance when i was in analysis of a, a dream that by appearances was not my own um so uh, do you want do, do you mind if i tell you the story Please. Okay. So um, this was quite a few years ago. Um, I was uh, in a class. In fact, I was in New 333 with John Verveke. Hmm. Uh, I, no, I had known John for 
10 years for a little longer, but it was the first class that I took with him, which was uh, um, uh, Buddhism and Cognitive Science, which eventually became his Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series. Oh, nice. So, and taking this class, like I said, I already knew him. We had some points of synchronistic connection, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, after I sort of signed up for this class, I decided that I had been foolish and I should switch into Cognitive Science. So, Anyway, but I was in this class, and in this class, I met a, a, a quite striking young woman, and we really hit it off. And uh, I very much had the sense of this kind of propulsive mutual self, you know, mutually right. accelerating self disclosure, which is a fancy way of saying I was falling for her. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, you know, and so I went into my analyst at the time, and I described this young woman. We had gone on a few dates, and, and he was like, Well, that's great. It sounds like, you know, you're falling in love. And I said, it's not great, man. It's a goddamn disaster. Uh, and he said, what do you mean? And I said, okay, look, this is what's going to happen. This and this and this and this and this. Uh, and it's all going to end in tears and heartbreak. Uh, and I'm going to do it anyway. Because yeah. I'm, I can feel myself getting seduced by the, by the enchantment of the situation. So, uh, and indeed, that is what happened. But in the midst of this, we, she and I had a really... Um, wonderful striking evening and she stayed over whatever and the next day was my mother's 50th birthday so we had to kind of get up early and I saw her out whatever and then I had to go out frankly hungover and <laughs> go go to this birthday party at a fancy restaurant and so I was really like barely slept um, from the night before and then I kind of dragged myself through and you know did the festivities and whatever and when I got back to my sister's place I conked out and I was in you know, one of these like highly elevated, you know, sort of mystically charged states of infatuation. So I go to sleep and I have this dream. And the dream uh, is that I'm standing in a kitchen and there's a mother and a daughter um, holding hands. And there's a big piece of um, furniture, like a kind of like a China hutch against the one wall. And on the wall by this thing is this enormous uh, spider, like a, like a dinner plate size spider uh, on the wall. Uh, and as I'm looking, it sort of uh, scuttles behind the piece of furniture on the wall and the mother and daughter have this um, sort of like slightly fearful reaction, whatever, and then I wake up. So I have some strong personal connection with spiders. I've always liked them. Uh, contra, contra people's intense distaste, I think they're really beautiful and interesting. But uh, so I've always had um, an affinity for spiders, but I don't ever recall having dreamed about them. And there was something hmm. so peculiar about the quality of this dream. So because I was experiencing this, like in this emotional intensity around this young woman and this whole thing, I had this feeling like it was sort of a big dream. Like it just didn't seem um, coincidental, despite the fact I couldn't explicitly link the content. So I sort of noted it. I mean, I was in analysis and I was pretty deep in a young at the time. Um, so I kind of noted it and didn't really say anything. And then when I spoke to this young woman the next day, I said, rather than disclosing anything about the nature of the dream, I just said, hey, just as a matter of interest, what, you know, what's your take on spiders? That was it. That was all I said. And she was like, oh my God, like, you know, this is actually a really big deal. When I was, when I was a, a girl back in Chile, I had a pet spider. Um, there's a breed of spider there called the chicken spider, the araña poito, uh, which are sort of wild, big and wild and fairly venomous. And she had one when she was about 14 that she kept as a pet until her parents realized that it hadn't been defanged. And so they made her release this thing into the wild and it sort of broke her heart. And she was like, oh yeah, and my earliest memory actually involves an araña poito. I was standing in the kitchen with my mother, she says, and she turned around and on her back, um, there, right on the back of her apron or something, there was an araña poito, and I pointed at it, and then she noticed it and kind of panicked, and it scuttled across the room and whatever. And I say, so this is not identical, obviously, but right. this is similarities Close are enough. sufficiently striking, right? especially given that I had specifically, obviously, sort of hedged my question to not prompt or cue. Yeah. Um. So I listened to this, and I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this is not the first time I've had an experience of this kind, particularly around strong emotional charge, romantic yeah. charge is no different. So I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I don't disclose my experience to her. Instead, I go to analysis the next day and I go in and my, I say to my analyst, look, this thing happened. And I, 
I outline it for him, the whole thing, more or less as I just did with you. And he says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I say, look, I'm open-minded. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I don't have a problem entertaining this notion. Like I don't, that's not, it's not a big deal for me, but like, what am I supposed to do with this? And he said with just like perfect calm, something that really stuck with me. Um, and has, I think, been a significant influence on my own work uh, in lots of ways, which was, he said, you know, when you've been doing this for a while, you just realize this stuff is happening all the time. And that is sort of my experience, too. It, this kind of stuff is happening all the time. Yeah. So, you know, what do we do with that? <laughs> it's the question, like, where, where does that fit in, right? Um, it's pretty hard to account for under any kind of standard, standard naturalistic conception. So maybe that does, in fact, speak to a sort of, um, I don't know, su supervening reality or a transcendent reality that can nevertheless make itself real and that we can make contact with. I don't know. Those are hard questions to solve, right? Yeah. And so I just like to keep myself sort of loose, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. I mean, the reality is just vastly, vastly weirder than we give it credit for, I think. Yeah. I think that's what enchanted me about Jung at first is it just opened up so all these vistas of possibility. It's just in so much just strange and numinous stuff. I think a, a lot of people come to Jung because of that. I think so too. Um, you know, it isn't that there isn't obvious intellectual value in consistency. You right. know, rational thinking and formal systems, you know, are good tools for consistency and that's important. But you know, as Gödel pointed out, uh, any sort of formal system can only be, very, you know, consistent, it can't be complete, or complete, it can't be consistent, you know, this is a slider you're moving around in. And Jung displays a great deal of honest completeness, in my opinion. He doesn't mm -hmm. shy away from things just because they're difficult. And, you know, more than any of the other sort of early psychodynamic theorists, he takes seriously spiritual experience and spiritual realities. You know, yeah. the, the sort of the material of the soul um, in, in a way that everybody else often sort of wants to discharge it. And Jung is like, look, if you if you strip it down in that way, you're losing something. There is something that exceeds these simple descriptions in one way or another. There's a mystery here. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of people come to it. I mean, certainly that was among the reasons that I found it so compelling when I was young. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's really, really radical among his contemporaries in that way. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Let me see, what other specific things have I to talk of with you? Mm -hmm. So, so touching on the hyperobject thing. Oh, yeah. So this is Let's something do I've not done. I've not done a deep dive into, into Morton, and I've sort of touched on object-oriented ontologies uh, in this domain of it and stuff a bit. And to me, the notion of the hyperobject, as I see it encountered, has a close relationship with, like, well, I think of it in relationship with Grant Morrison's notion of the hyper sigil and all these kinds of time extended structures. But the example, of course, that always gets used is global warming. And I find that an interesting one. Like it's the complexity of the network systems, the inability to sort of see the structure as a whole, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it's operating in a consistent way. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I've thought a lot lately, lately the last few years about, <laughs> um, about the ways that our technologies are hyperextended uh, outside our immediate um, sort of desires around them and what that means. And so one of the things I've said is like, you know, when we thought, when we invented the internal combustion engine and the personal automobile, right. we thought what we were inventing was a vehicle for convenience and getting, getting to happy motoring suburbia a little faster. Mm -hmm. um, but what we actually invented was a terraforming engine, yeah. which is serving to liberate carbon into the atmosphere to nudge us closer to Venus, right? Like the machine that we built and the machine we thought we built are two different things. And it's a question of yeah. scale, right? And similarly, I've said, I have some sneaking suspicions that what we thought we were making when we created, you know, Facebook say was a tool to yeah. get together with people from the knitting club and catch up with folks from high school. But Not what that. we actually, no, what we actually built was an enormous... <laughs> an enormous engine to raise the global temperature of politics. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Anyway, but I think what's, your, what's your take on the, oh, sorry, I was just going to ask what your take on the hyperobjects thing is. Oh, no, that's good. Um, 
I was going to mention insofar as technology, I think that's why there's the, the apocryphal tradition, the book of Enoch and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, we have that idea of technological dissemination being demonic in a certain sense. It's, mm-hmm. And, you know, you see that in, I think it's, is it Jeremy Narby? I think so. The idea that um, fauna are actually the, the ones who communicate to shamans that they're edible and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we have like these, instruments of higher complexity than we realize that we start to use kind of uh, without awareness of what sort of uh, consequences it's going to have mm-hmm. and there's there's all sorts of things um, for instance when a poet writes a poem there's generally or there's always greater complexity within the within the piece than he or she is aware of so when it's when it's read and it has sort of um comes into a, a dialectical relationship with the reader it's uh quickens something new it's kind of like is it that yeah it's axiom of maria you have a, a new th- a new third thing coming out of the relation or the the interaction of the one the other thing as far as hyper objects go yeah I, i'm not sure i think I, th- I think of them as 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 gods in a certain sense. Um, what the difference between a hyper object, or where the continuum is between hyper object and archetype, or I, th- I think complexes are probably closer than just archetypes because of their more embodied subjective relationships with things. Mm-hmm. Um, you have the nucleus, the the principal. Um, around which associations cluster rather than just sort of the actual form Mm -hmm. so i'm not sure to what extent they're the fact that they're participative jung is so uh circumspect about talking about the difference between the subjective and the collective unconscious or where exactly the the well merges from one to the other right there's a certain extent to where, and this is, I wanted to talk to you about the potentiality for transpersonal individuation because of this. Mm-hmm. There's a certain extent to which if one were to individuate completely, they would have to individuate everything. Right, right. Yeah. This, is a, this is the kind of alchemical principle, right? Uh, yeah, the philosopher's the, stone, yeah. Yeah, right, the salvation of, of matter. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of an interesting question. In some ways, in fact, I think it ties usefully, I guess, around to this question of hyper objects, like when you're talking about language in this way, um, I, you know, it, he's fairly out of fashion, but he's interestingly structuralist from a, an archetypal perspective, which is the work of Northrop Frye. And he mm. talks about within language, the concept of, uh, I'm going to mangle this pronunciation, but lang, uh, which is this, like the, the texture within language, sort of the binding tissue that operates within language not even within the specific utterance and stuff. And obviously when you start to consider things in time extended terms, the notion of the real gets a bit funny. So like a thing that I sometimes like to try to bend my students with a bit is the the notion that like, there is a sense in which Superman is realer than we are, Yeah. right? He, hmm. he was around before we were born and he'll be around after we're dead, odds are. And he exists simultaneously in like an enormous number of places, like far more people know Superman than know me. And right. And so he's not sort of, you know, he's not realized as a being in the same way that we are realized as a being, but nevertheless, of course, there's influence there. Right. Um, My mom, who's a Catholic and these days uh, somewhat of a, um, she's a Catholic in question. She's had, she's had, a mounting series of issues with the uh, church over, you know, the last, I don't know, probably 20 years and, and recently. So she's sort of grappling with this stuff. But when I was younger, a teenager, you know, she, one of the things she periodically used to say when we were having these long conversations is like, do you think Jesus was real? Right. Meaning right. like, do you think he was a historical personage? And we, we've had lots of conversations around this. And sometime around 25, I decided that I think I settled on an answer that I was happy with, which was, well, you know, Jesus is a historical individual, like a person who was a body that lived in a place, et cetera, um, is 
not quite moot, but Jesus the story, right? Yeah. Jesus as a narrative is one of the most significant individuals that ever lived. And that's who everybody's right. been interacting with anyway, mostly. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I remember walking down the street one time and I don't know what frame of mind I was in, but all of a sudden I looked at a church, a Catholic church. And it just, I suddenly struck me the way in which it was a time displaced piece of culture, because what I was looking at was the state church of the Roman empire, right? It was like watching a mammoth wander out of the bushes. Like it was this weird, like, oh, that's a continuous thing that has been, right? The story of Jesus in this particular way has been organizing matter into familiar patterns in the same way as bodies are organized into familiar patterns for a couple of thousand years. Like it is a, a long persistent thing that is organizing matter. And so, you know, what does it mean to be real in that sense? Uh, you know, so, you know, in that way, obviously the hyper object to me, right? These sort of like, you know, the, the idea that churches instantiate themselves in space and obviously they're sort of translated through us, but, you know, there's a sense in which there are repeated patterns and structures and persistence and a continuity and, you know, who's to say, right? Whether or not that constitutes an object or not. With individuation, Obviously, individuation is a sort of a time-stretched function, right? Like, it's meaningless to talk about a moment of individuation, or even, I think, a culminating individuation. I don't think right. it's a terminal. It's not like enlightenment. You know, it's not a terminal event. Uh, it's, it's a process that, because of the inexhaustibility of certain archetypes, is, I think, sort of necessarily bottomless. You know, you never finish eating the shadow, so you're yeah. never finished kind of working it through. But... I think you're really onto something, you know, once you start getting into the upper ranges of individuation, upper, okay, big caveat yeah, there, right. upper, right, the stuff around the self, I mean, what you're fundamentally dealing with is, as I said, like, contact with the process of the co-creation of your entire universe. Yeah. Right, which sounds, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like you know, and there's a way in which people sometimes when I get into conversations about magic, and people will be like, "Well, it's all in your head," and I'll be like, "Well, let's say that it is. Is that less significant? Like, yeah, okay, I can't fly around maybe and throw a fireball, but if I can change my entire experience and my view of the world and what matters to me and how I see things and whatever, doesn't that seem kind of significant to you? Like, yeah, that's it. That's your world, folks. Yeah." You know? Once you really start um, understanding that how much your kind of epistemological framework has an impact on your salience landscape, like your whole world really changes based on what you believe. Yes. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. Um, you know, and cottoning on to that, uh, you know, it's, there's a process involved there. Like you go through a bunch of shifts and I think, you know, when we're younger, no matter how savvy we are, we are in a sense, naive to the shifts and so we take them to be real right mm -hmm. we fall in love and it's just like everything literally is brighter and smells better we get depressed and literally we think the world is shit and everything is bad and like yeah. it takes us a while before we realize that these shifts that are occurring are intimately related to our own states and then only later do we get the sense that we can maybe intervene on that in certain ways and like there's a process yeah right? um so uh, there is a kind of sense even at that narrower scope that you know that making contact that creating the philosophical gold right mm -hmm. is a process that would be sort of broadly redemptive and transformative the question then is to what extent is that a more extended process and i would argue that you know in some ways like the history of influential religious figures tends to show that these sorts of massive transformations of character and consciousness are powerfully contagious in ways that are not simply explicable on the basis maybe of um that does sound like a good idea because often they represent you know like huge disjunctions from what people are doing and yet right the the way in which they can bend circumstances around them um, yeah is, is exceptionally powerful right yeah so yeah you know yeah but you know an ultimate redemption of the whole world um Maybe that seems like sort of a, that seems like an asymptotic goal, you know, yeah. like you're always approaching, but never quite getting there. Yeah. So, I mean, as a Christian, I believe that Christ did the ultimate shadow work in taking all of sin, present, past and future upon himself. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of an interesting because, you, you know, even Jung 
talks pretty extensively about Christ as a symbol of the self mm-hmm. or, the, or the self as a symbol of Christ, whenever you want to do it. But um, yeah, so I, I guess that's the ultimate instantiation of that pattern in my mind. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, um, the, there's a reason that, that there's a reason that that has staying power. Yeah. <laughs> right you know like there's a reason it has staying power it's not accidental that it has staying power and we um you know we sort of deride it i think at our peril it obviously isn't the only model in a sense for that kind of transcendence and this is one of the reasons why i'm i'm often quite interested you know um a lot of the time when i'm teaching this uh, you know one of the questions students will hit me with is like do you think enlightenment is the same thing as individuation right that's a right. Pretty common one yeah and i'll say no, I don't. And they'll say, oh, so, you know, kind of like, well, which one do you think is better? And I'll say, Mm. see, I think this is the problem. The problem is that we're used to thinking of things as somehow progressing towards a single, right? There's a single point that we're all getting to. And I'm not sure that that's true. Yeah. I think that there are sort of a thousand paths up the mountain and, you know, it is possible to advance ourselves right, to become more complex, more sophisticated, and more empowered beings in many different ways. And that's actually a good thing. So I think it is possible in a sense, like, there are lots of different sort of proposals for what a higher being is, right, from the human concept, given different traditions and techniques. And I'm kind of inclined to think, like, all the ones that have, like, a, you know, like, a reasonably, um, a reasonably, like credible pedigree. Um, right. I, was I, trying, I was trying to be yeah. trying to be charitable because I don't no, want to get fine. hate mail from Scientologists, but <laughs> uh, you know, reasonably, you know, charitable or, or a reasonably credible pedigree, you know, I, my inclination is to think, yeah, yeah, they're all right. Like, it's just, it's a question of sort of what you want to turn into. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and now I could be wrong. It could also, of course, be the case that in some perennial sense, uh, you know, these things actually do converge to a point. Certainly there are definitely similarities, lots of similarities. So, yeah. 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 No, no I, it, it, yeah, yeah. Things, things are, things are complicated and strange mm-hmm. and strange. Um, let me see here. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Super important. If not, we can go back and maybe talk about, oh yeah, I wanted to, so as a Christian, I think our psychic ontology is sort of more set up like a mountain um, where you have Christ at the top and you have potentiality and sort of darkness on the outside and the, around the mountain. Whereas in Jung, we have kind of a circular ontology um, with the self in the middle and sort of everything just needs to be put into sort of fluid harmony within that sort of a musical interchange. Mm-hmm. So how does I'm not I'm not sure what the what the eschatology of individuation is for you. Like what's the point? Well, so I mean that's a that's an interesting question. You're right. He's often cagey about this stuff. Um, you know, I think that you can find it to some extent in his adoption of the alchemical ethos. You know, it's, there are points, obviously, where he's sort of approaching it with a, a pretty Gnostic kind of bent. And yeah. I get it. Every, you know, not everybody, but lots of people end up having like a flirtation phase with Gnosticism and there's good things in there. No question. Right. It's just that, you know, often it's an unsatisfying conclusion, I think, for people, um, because it's, you know, the answer is we have to escape the matrix. And that is not a necessarily a satisfying endpoint. Um, yeah. You know, I would tend to say that his sort of attachment to the alchemical ethos tells you a lot. Um, you know, it speaks to that kind of microcosmic, macrocosmic, redemptive kind of arc. Now, yeah. in terms of like, um, you know, in terms of this sort of like the direction towards the, the end or the goal or the apocalypse of the revelation, right? It's not as clear to me that he, I mean, he certainly doesn't see that as terminal, right? But he doesn't no. see it as like an, a, a bounded end, or at least not in the terms that most people would, because he clearly sees sort of ages continuing to roll forward. That's pretty clear in things like Ion. But, yeah. you know, the idea that, that a revelation or something, both at the individual and collective level, 
can herald a massive transformation in the nature of the collective is very clear in his work, yeah. right? So in answer to Job, for right. instance. So the idea that we can change our relationship and we can change our relationship too, but also that our actions collectively and individually in the world can have an effect that seems to change the nature of the collective unconscious over time is that that's a radical idea yeah. I mean, in a sense, right? Because, you know, like if you, not to put too fine a point on it, but the concept of the answer to Job is basically like Job guilt tripped God into incarnating at the end yeah. of the day, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a radical idea. You know, it's an idea I think that has a certain kind of appeal, um, you know, as, as a way of bridging some of the gaps that you see textually, right? Um, and uh, and trying to account for the sort of the transformation in the nature of the figure that we see between Old Testament and New Testament. Um, you know, Genesis God, who I've written a lot about, is I think an amazing and fascinating figure, but he's also capricious and um, seemingly far from omnipotent. Like he's a very different kind of figure than the, the God that we hear about and talk about in the New Testament. And, you know, he, he has a lot more character in a certain sense. Like he's very, he's very embodied. He's very character. He's kind of moody and stuff in a way that I think is appealing and probably representative of the period in some ways. So the idea that, and, and who's to say at some level, how much of that is in our interface with, with rather than a manifestation of the thing in itself. Yeah, whatever. So I was going to say, that's kind of how we think about it as a series right. of revelations while he's always the same. So exactly right. So, so you know the idea that our that our relationship with it can change in a some sense the presenting nature of it right is a pretty powerful idea uh you know if you really drill down into the heart of that what that means is that there exists the possibility for somebody to do inner work that can in a sense change the apparent nature of god <laughs> i mean wow now yeah. maybe that's a, maybe that's a process that's prefigured in some way like maybe there is a set of stages or steps and he sort of implies that because he tags it onto um sort of astrological metaphors um i have never been able to swallow astrology um i've tried a lot um and the only book on astrology i've ever been able to handle was cosmos and psyche by richard tarnas and really only the first 50 pages but you know he's trying to lend us certain kinds of cosmological structure long mm -hmm. range structure and in some ways i actually think he's doing a clever thing there because uh because the modern world is still framed in babylonian time right there's a reason our clocks are still in 12s and 60s yeah um and circles uh so you know what what is the the nature and relationship there i mean i'm not sure that it's so different jung's centralized notion of the self and the kind of christ at the top of the mountain that you're talking about if the mountain is round you know what i mean yeah well Mountains are round, so at the base, mountains usually. Are, yeah, <laughs> so, mountains are round. Like, you know, the, like there is definitely, despite the fact that the self is proposed to be both the center and the totality, right? So it is the center mm -hmm. and the totality. And I usually yeah. use the sun as the metaphor because, um, because if you take the sun out of the solar system, you don't have a solar system. Right. Yeah. Right? Everything just flies off in a space. So it's not identical with every part of it. But if the sun isn't there, you don't have a system. Um, yeah. Right, and you certainly don't have any life. So, you know, the self, you know, is like this, and the relationship um, to it as such, insofar as he sees Christ as, you know, a par excellence symbol of the self. I think that there is an elevated position. I mean, ultimately speaking, one is looking to, in a sense, um, not become identical with, maybe, but render oneself transparent to the will and agency of this higher purpose within oneself right yeah well that's not fundamentally different than the basic shift in relation that you're going through in in normal Jungian individual normal Jungian individuation which is yeah. like the whole trick is trying to relativize the ego not to destroy the ego you still have to live there but uh to right. stop making it so goddamn bossy all the time yeah yeah <laughs> there's kind of a very like in the fathers is a very sort of light I, as far as i can tell and i don't know if i can tell rightly or not the the self for the fathers is pretty much just 
docile. It's just a disposition of attention. And everything else is sort of appendage. It's just it's just garments of skin. <laughs> all right. all psychic stuff. So we don't we wouldn't identify with good things or negative things. And there's also an idea that the saints are the only people who are actually human. So r- rather than us changing the collective unconscious through our individuation, it's rather like we're injuring the psychic economy by being, I don't know, fallen folk. So the individuated mm. people are actually the ones who are, <laughs> have been reinstated into the correct position. Right. So it's, so it's a fallen state and a redemption arc. Mm. Yeah, right? classically. Yeah. So things are sort of out of alignment and we are persistent. We persist in being willfully and ignorantly out of alignment, which mucks everything up. Uh, yeah. But if we got ourselves squared properly, uh, we would sort of pass into the same right seeing. Yeah. Right. So, Something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Which I'm not sure I totally understand. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's that's a that's an idea that has certainly lots of echoes and resonance in other traditions i I imagine there's you can come at that in a lot of different directions i think there's something to it and i'm not claiming that i fully understand it either obviously but um yeah i mean part of that of course is predicated on the fallen concept which is always something that i'm yeah you know like maybe maybe that's true um i am more and more inclined as time goes on to see things neither in terms of decline nor in terms of progress um, but rather just in terms of change. So I apply kind of no free lunch hypothesis yeah. to the question instead of looking at things in terms of like, whatever, moral ascent or descent. Um, yeah, it's not so much, it's more of an ontological change than a moral change, I think. Right. Hmm. It's kind of, I don't, like I said, I don't really understand it, but it's not, I'm still getting acquainted with sort of the orthodox take, but it's not the sort of union original sin sort of thing. It, right. it, really, it really has to do with like a concert of, I don't know. So it has something to do with like that super shadow work. <laughs> right, right. That I'm not, I'm not sure how. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, these are obviously, these are huge, huge heady questions that have preoccupied some of the smartest people that ever lived for centuries so i i am hesitant (laughs) i'm hesitant to venture too far into making like firm pronouncements but i mean it's i mean it sounds fascinating obviously i should read more in this area well yeah i i yeah there's a lot there's a lot to read and a lot to lot to learn i think part of uh, going back to epistemological humility and certitude i think part of it for me is like performatively i'm gonna exemplify some sort of belief in something so i uh, you know jung at the end of answer to job says like epistemologically we can't know anything so whatever like pragmatically creates an abundance of beauty within your own life and the lives of your family and leads you towards the good fundamentally speaking is pretty much what you should adhere to um so there's that and I think the the another difference between kind of Christian individuation and Jungian is the anthropology within Jung is much more individual, whereas the the Christian is it's also very individual in the sense that the the self actually never perishes, but it's only a self in relationship to other selves. So it's much more of an ecclesiastical salvation rather than individuation taking place within isolation. I think this might, I listened to your, I listened to like a very wide scattering of your lectures. I didn't make it through all of them because there's a lot and they're all really great. I, I cool. enjoy them. Good, um, I'm glad you like them. But I listened to the three on saints and wizards. And so I think that dichotomy is interesting. I'm not sure if it's just an apparent dichotomy or not, but Im- immediately what came to mind for me is Gandalf, our, right. our Christian wizard kind of. <laughs> and, uh, you mentioned there being sort of a difference between maybe we can take you and uh, uh, Dr. Vervanke, for examples, of being more of a teleological commitment to 
the achievement of wisdom or in, or just instrumentality and sort of beauty, the beauty of multiplicity and things. And mm-hmm. so I think like if you actually look at the miracles that Gandalf performs, they're, he's pretty parsimonious with that sort of thing. I think mm-hmm. people, modern people actually watch Lord of the Rings. Most people don't read it. And they're like, where's the magic? Yeah, where's the magic? I don't even know all the magic is just the ring Narya. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. He actually pretty much does nothing. He's just an advisor. And I think you can see that in Merlin, too, who's kind of the other archetypal, uh, like, Western wizard figure. He does some stuff sometimes, but it's it's actually, and part of this is because it's Christianized, but part of it, but he, the things that he does instrumentally are, are almost leftovers of kind of his, whatever his pagan past is, and the rest, he's just an advisor. So I think it's, I think it's more, the distinction is something like just what's the end in sight but i understand like as as i was always very infatuated with the wizard figure and i still am um especially like among the celtic saints and stuff you see some pretty pretty wizardy folk Mm -hmm. um so i think that's an interesting distinction and it might have something to do with modernity i think the scientist has become the wizard in a lot of ways or the wizards become the scientist um I don't know. I've heard you talk about cognitive sciences, alchemy, and stuff like that. So it's mm-hmm. kind of a yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's a commonly held linkage. That's a that's a thing that I'm trying to push. Uh, but I, I like it. Strikes it. me as being <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems to be a it seems to be a strong mapping to me. Although it's mm-hmm. a tough sell in some ways. But um, yeah, you know, there is a sense in which there are certainly some traditions where you can see the relationship between the saint and the wizard. Uh, and the relationship is much clearer. So at the positive end, you're right. There is this kind of, there's kind of merger. Like there's a certain amount of supernaturalism, but mostly just good advice, right? You're right. Um, kind of funny. <laughs> but then there are also lots of traditions that involve either conflict between, say, saints and sorcerers, mm-hmm. uh, right? Or people dropping out of the religious process and sort of deploying the partial ill-gotten gains of their training towards magical ends. So this is yeah. something that you see quite commonly in the Tibetan traditions, and I find fascinating. When people drop out of monk school and they become warlocks, right? yeah. like they go into the black magic business. And yeah. you know, there's, there is an implicit danger, uh, I think, that that actually captures, which is that the pursuit of spiritual discipline really can grant unusual degrees of attention and ability and focus and charisma and it really is possible to develop yourself using these kinds of techniques but if you don't go the whole way if you don't sort of break through into the full moral dimensions of this and and go through it and that's often hard if you sort of turn aside from it well what you're left is with i mean a bunch of super powers but a regular sized moral compass right and or maybe worse right and then you're like well how am i going to pay the bills i guess i'll kill people with magic for money yeah right or (laughs) i'll sell love charms or whatever right so you know you and that kind of thing you see that turn up there's a bunch of really interesting sort of instances of it in folklore and mythology and stuff in that case the relationship is very clear it's like right magic is a deployment of kind of partial right? Psychotechnology or something, right? If we want to use the cognitive science term. But at the higher levels, yeah, I think it's less distinct. And that's why at the end of the day in the conversation with John, I concluded that the ultimate superpower is wisdom anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe we're not talking about different things. It's just that for me, the initial presentation is is kind of a Baroque one. I like the The aesthetic. I I mean, I kind of in the same way. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I have a special affinity for the for the Celtic saints, I think. But yeah, you'll see all sorts of things in there. They have wizard shouting battles across channels in the sea and all sorts of things like that. But yeah, Yeah, I think, I I think there's an implicit analogy too with, with the sort of, mm, sort of that, that, that really high degree of instrumental capability and a small degree of awareness, like the, the incommensurate development of those two things with the sort of scientific weird mess we've put us ourselves into like with facebook and things we've been talking about there it's like there's just not not sufficient consciousness to be using these things it's not clear to me that there ever has been yeah it's not like we've been an especially wise bunch 
ever. ever. Yeah. Um, but you know, but obviously there is a point at which um, you know, things <laughs> things escalated. Like our, our technologically instrumental abilities hit a level where the fact that we're doing dumb things a lot of the time, or that we have not yet escaped uh, you know, our sort of more basic drives and things matters. It always mattered, but now it matters. Yeah. And you know, uh, there's um, uh, an Owen Barfoot quote. Let me see if I can find it, hold on. Um, there's an Owen Barfoot quote, which sort of hits on this post 1945. Uh, he was one of the, one of the inklings, Ugh, I can't find it, but he was one of the inklings, right? So he was one of the kind of Oxford crew along with Tolkien and along with C.S. Lewis and a bunch of those guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says something post 1945 and I'll, I'll paraphrase, but basically he's like, what we discovered in the atomic bomb after toying with the, or like after playing with the outside uh, of it, like a mechanical toy for 300 years is the workings of our own unconscious mind. And like, okay, there's a bunch of ways you can take that. But really one of the ways to take it is this, you know, 1945 marks this sort of crucial moment in a sense in our technological civilization, because it's the moment where incontrovertibly we gained the ability to obliterate our Everyone. civilization yeah like that <laughs> six minutes i mean that's i grew up at the tail end of the cold war so yeah. it's very salient to me but like it's a remarkable idea and never mind all of the fascinating alchemical aspects of atomic weaponry right you're splitting matter at a fundamental scale uh yeah. and it creates a, a thing that archetypally in and of itself is weird because it ties together the sky and the ground with ephemera a mushroom cloud both of which are ephemeral and one of which is high and one of which is low and right. Yeah. And like, it, it's just a devastating concept, right. And something we've lost sight of since 45, because we haven't deployed these things. But the point is, it's like, yeah, fine. It was always the case that we were foolishly bashing each other's heads in with rocks for dumb reasons that has been going on for a long time. But now it is the case that by sheer numeracy, by the slow drip of our technological impact, but also just by, in some cases, raw force, you know, we have to, we have to, you know, start to transform ourselves because if not, uh, the probabilities are against us. Yeah. Yeah. It really just puts a little bit of uh, pressure. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the Alembic is uh, sufficiently heated, I think at this point now. Yeah. Well, one hopes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see a lot of, a lot of this kind of discussion happening. You know, as a young man, uh, it was just not present. Maybe it was, and I just wasn't aware of it. But I've been steeped in this stuff for a long time, so it's certainly not new. I mean, the the apocalyptic thread of thinking it goes back quite some time, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and even in its modern formulations, the like we need to get our shit together before we destroy ourselves, right? It goes back well before 1945 you see it coming up out of world war one you see it coming up before that so there has been this intimation some people have in fact had the foresight to sort of see where all this points and where the the kind of discontinuity that you're talking about between yeah. the technical sophistication of our society versus the comparatively anemic aspects of our sort of emphasis on spiritual development um you know i have some unorthodox positions in that respect um, because among other things, you know, many years ago, in fact, when I, no, was it that course? Anyway, years ago when I was doing coursework with John, I wrote a paper for a final exam once, you know, and my basic thesis was like, look, meditation is terrific and all, and cognitive science is good too. Um, but if that's all we have, we're fucked. Yeah. We're fucked because there are a set of competing exponential curves at work here. Population curves, depletion curves, right? There are technical curves that are sort of working against that. So, you know, no question. Artificial intelligence, that could be a very big deal. It's already kind of a big deal, but it could be right. an actually big deal. You know, nanotechnology could be an actually big deal. Fusion could be an actually big deal. Like there are some things here, genetic engineering to some extent. There are some technologies here that stand to sort of be game-changing. Yeah, But simultaneously, we're also dealing with 
the pileup of environmental factors, social factors, et cetera, which are interacting in various ways that, right, it's, it's all a hyper object of doom. Mm -hmm. So with those two curves in competition, if the only thing that we have to shift the line is a psychotechnology that's slow, difficult, ineffective, yeah. uncomfortable, like it's not that it's it's great for what we have, but like maybe yeah. there's a way to do this better. And that's one of the reasons why I have as much interest as I do in what I used to call um, <laughs> uh, what I used to call um, uh, neurotheology once upon a time, but that's oh, like yeah. narrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm very uh, and I've been interested in this since I was a teenager. I did work in this area when I was a teenager with uh, uh, magnetically induced experiences, but um, uh, sort of in not, not together with, although I was in communication with Dr. Persinger at Laurentian, if you know his work with the, the God helmet. Oh yeah. Um, so I was in contact with him because I built something similar um, as a teenager and we, we really hit it off, which was nice because he initially didn't know I was a teenager, but he took it quite well. And uh, but anyway, so I've been interested in this and the like, basically, it's like, okay, look, the, there's no question the sort of scientific golem has slipped the leash in ways that are a real problem. And the, the fracture, especially in the West between instrumental knowledge within the university and the wisdom traditions that were embodied in sort of the monastic whatever, torn away and that hasn't happened to the same extent everywhere but mm -hmm. there, there, but there has been a, a splitting right and the question i think has to be like okay how can we bring this back together in a way that allows us to actually leverage some of the things we've learned to create something to create the you know as per the axiom of maria prophetisa to create the third and then create the fourth which is the one can yeah. we take that technological acumen and turn it towards a technology in some sense of wisdom, which organically integrates together, right? Well, we curb the technology with the best methods of wisdom and distributed cognition, community wisdom and stuff that we have from working on this problem for thousands of years, but nevertheless accelerate that stuff with some of the other things we've learned. Like, can we bring it together? Yeah. Um, I hope we can, although the clock is kind of ticking, you know? Right, right, yeah. So, so psychedelics and things like that. Yeah, that's an aspect of it. Although, yeah, that's an aspect of it. I go back and forth on to yep. whether or not I think that those are sophisticated or crude, and I often can't decide. I, yeah, I think I'm a little more skeptical. Uh, mm. I just don't think people have the discernment to. Um, I think that they are a useful and valid tool, but they're far from being universal. Like, sometimes I hear people say things of the form, well, what we need to do to solve the world's problems is get everybody to take ayahuasca. And it's like, no, it's not for everybody for one thing, but also what you would get is a lot of confused muddle if it yeah. was happened sort of without interpretive context. Um, I do think that there is a use, and I mean, I'm pretty open about feeling that there's a use, not just to psychedelics, but to altered states in general, you know, and all right. of the various ways of getting there. I think that those are an important part of doing this kind of work, but but you do have to have um, a certain tool set and skill built up to yeah. get something useful out of it. Otherwise, it can just be a distraction or a form of spiritual bypassing, or yeah. uh, or it can, in fact, you know, set you back. Right? Yeah. No, I think. I mean, it's, it's talking about altered states is strange. Is strange, except in the extremes. I think because like our normative phenomenology is just going to vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about this. It's very much a spectrum. Um, I, obviously we have certain replicable, seemingly consistent states that we can put ourselves into, mm -hmm. but again, yeah, it's, it seems like there's just not very much mm, vacillation. People aren't peregrinating from their kind of diffusely scattered attention or their TikTok spiraling attention and up to the kind of more dispassionate attention it just seems like there's a paucity of modes um, yeah um yeah and i mean some of that of course is deliberate so right. once you know th there has been a shift it's always been sort of true but there's been a shift towards attention as a currency 
Um, and yeah. once that happens, and it's not just social media, I mean, this goes back to TV and advertising, and it runs through things like, um, you know, video games too, right? But the point is that there's, that controlling attention in a certain kind of way has always been useful, but the technologies and the techniques of doing so have gotten much better, where now, um, there's a bunch of interesting work on this, like uh, there's work by the um, a late scholar, uh, Ion Quilianu, uh, in a book called uh, Magic and Eros in the Renaissance. And he <laughs> makes the interesting proposition. He draws a line from sort of uh, Neoplatonic Renaissance through to some of the stuff that Giordano Bruno was saying. And Bruno has this whole thing where he's like, look, the, the real way to, you know, uh, get a society to work and function would be to invest Eros into a symbolic framework and use that to move the Eros of people, magically speaking, which if you read deeply into what he's saying, means what he's saying basically is propaganda is a better method than violence. Yeah. And that is, you know, the, the manufacture of consent to borrow Chomsky's, you know, uh, term. Uh, you know, this is why Kulianu sort of makes the claim that we live in a, we all live in a sorcerer state, as he puts it. Yeah. Or magician state, maybe is his term, which uh, is, to yeah. me, like provocative, obviously, but also sort of true. Uh, likewise, right? Um, you know, I talk about this, and you can, if you've ever seen Century of the Self, the Adam Curtis documentary, mm -hmm. you know, well, it's amazing. Four hours, but in four individual hours. And if okay. you watch the first hour, you'll get this. So he, so Adam Curtis talks about sort of the origins of modern advertising. And it turns out that modern advertising, as we are familiar with it, um, traces back to kind of one person. Um, uh, 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 Edward, Ber uh, Edward Bernays is this one person. And Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew. Yeah. yeah so he yeah, was, yeah. you know, an American guy who did propaganda work in World War I. He sent some money to Uncle Siggy in Vienna when <laughs> Freud is on hard times. In exchange, as a thank you, Freud sends a big box. Here's my collected works. Edward Bernays gets hired by companies after World War I because production is high and they're not selling stuff and they're concerned about the economic effects. And they're like, can you use propaganda to convince people to buy things? Edward Bernays goes flipping through Uncle Siggy's books and suddenly finds this idea that, hey, wait, there are these deep unconscious emotional drives in people <laughs> that you can appeal to symbolically. Huh, I wonder if this will be useful. And so he begins to deploy this. To change it so that it's not propaganda, he invents a new term. He calls it public relations. PR. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, he completely changes the landscape of the modern world. Prior to that, products are essentially speaking like utility arguments in advertising, right? right. Buy gold bond foot, foot powder because it keeps your feet the driest. Like that's the kind of thing. After that, it's all of these charged symbolic appeals yeah, and that's... an economic system driven by consumerism. It's driven by us buying things that we don't need for rational reasons. And if we stop doing that, the whole system falls apart. So again, it's like there's a conversion of the healing arts into a kind of black magic mode to fit certain agendas. You know, that mode of controlling our attention, controlling our impulses to drive economic action and keep us dissatisfied goes quite some ways back. But everything yeah. has gotten vastly more sophisticated. And the, the ability to track, intervene, control attention is just way higher. You don't have to appeal to CIA mind control technology. It turns out that it's it's not that hard to do this just with yeah. priming and selection and so on and so forth. So that's yeah, pretty banal in a certain sense. But. Yeah, yes, in a certain sense. But in another sense, it's, you know, it's sort of terrifying and game changing yeah. uh, in a lot of ways. So I do think that that system, for what it's worth, has a vested interest in keeping people locked into having mode right from having mode uh issues locked into questions of anxiety and boredom locked into a sense of incompleteness because there there ain't no profit in finding a connection to community in the cosmos and typically people who have that yeah. experience don't want to buy shit yeah no that's it's yeah it's all the fruits yeah. the fruits yeah, I think that's I, I kind of see liturgy as like as a good as the best answer as, because it's accessible, you know, not just the the mad scientist with the really strong academic leaning, 
pursuing his his own uh, sort of self enlightenment or individuation, however you want to talk about it. It's much more communal. It just sort of, sort of it affords transformation without kind of the directedness of something like meditation. Sure. Um, and it also is an attention. It trains your attention because basically it's a suspension of all other of distraction for four or five hours in communion mm-hmm. with other people. So mm-hmm. I, I think breaking off some of those, I don't know, nefarious gossamers that are our phones and loud mm-hmm. things and all that sorts of stuff is just so salubrious. It's almost beyond imagining. Like I, I remember I, I, after I quit social media, like two months later, I just realized I'm so much happier all the time. So I've never had it. Um, I, that's not why, true. wise I, man. <laughs> well, I had a Facebook account for like three months. My um, girlfriend at the time switched over from my space and I followed suit and it, and basically it sent me so many like notifications in the first three days that I just asked myself the question that I ask about every technology, which is what is this doing for me? I, now I avoided having a, a mobile phone until relatively recently seven years maybe eight years I guess not that recently now but like I just didn't have one for a long time yeah right and I did have mobile technologies I had uh, I had a first edition iPod which was a remarkable device I could hit you know I could do many of the same things in a hotspot or something but I was just like why do I need to take a phone call at the grocery store or a movie theater like why can't I just use the phone the way that I've been using it I like using it that way yeah um social media likewise I I unquestionably it brings certain kinds of benefits to people but you know my suspicions over time have been sort of increasingly borne out that the effects it seems to have on people the the negative outweighs the positive too often for my tastes Um, and it occupies a lot of people's attention and certainly I'm not completely free of that I mean I mean we're talking over something I don't know if this is going to go on YouTube but like I don't watch a lot of YouTube, but I obviously post things on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I'm engaged with the internet. I find that it's, you know, that's a delightful technology and I use it in all kinds of ways, despite the fact that I think it's problematic. Um, so certainly I'm not free from that space, but there's no question, man, I have a deep, uh, I have a deep repeated yearning to move away from it. Like I, I fantasize about throwing my phone in the lake and, you know, I collect yeah. books compulsively, uh, but you know, the idea of like taking a year to take a digital Sabbath and just like roll things yeah. back to total analog technologies. This appeals to me so much, but, but it's difficult, right? I'm embedded in all right. the ways, right? Professional yeah. connection. You're not allowed. Yeah, basically. you really aren't. Yeah, it's very, it, it's, yeah. One yeah. could get very uh, almost paranoid about that, that sort of thinking, but yeah sometimes yeah. i just put my phone under a blanket i'm like i don't even want to look at right that. Yeah, yeah i keep mine on uh, airplane mode a lot yeah um so anytime i'm seeing clients it's on airplane mode i put it on airplane mode at night increasingly i'm just putting it on airplane mode all the <laughs> time I'm just doing stuff this is on airplane mode i don't want i just don't want it to be bleeping and blurping at me all the time i resent that i have to check seven different different communication apps when i wake up in the morning like it makes me nuts but yeah. Um, you know, there is obviously some utility to it. There's a reason I finally got one. So I'm a bit back and forth on it, but nevertheless, the, um, you know, it does interfere with, it does interfere with, I think the ability to do depth work of various kinds, spiritually and psychologically, like you have to be able to set aside unfragmented time and space that isn't consumed by um, explicit, uh, extrinsically motivated, you know, self-improvement. And that isn't, you know, the various things that we're told to do, right? Um, the soul can't be a hustle. Yeah, right, right, yeah. It, it, which so much of the, I think there's more to aesthetic than people realize a lot of times, but so much of the aesthetic with that sort of program, and it really is a program, I like that that way of talking about it as a hustle, you know, kind of this uh, self-help and get in shape and here's all these supplements and things like that. It's mm-hmm. very, very much like improve yourself so that your Instagram is more appealing. <laughs> There's right. no higher aim than that. 
and it's right yeah it's just vapid kind of and yeah it is i mean i i hold out the like faith uh, the generalized faith in humanity that what all that represents is of course a deep hunger and yearning Uh, people are trying to meet a need and they just don't know how right no yeah and so you know the hope is that something will push past that but yeah there is really a the, the system, the program such as it is, is very good at co-opting things. So it's got an expert at co-opting counterculture um, since the 60s. And, uh, you know, also like, you know, there's there's the joke right around the second psychedelic renaissance, which is in the 60s, you know, Timothy Leary is like, take LSD so you can turn on, tune in and drop out, right? It was enough that it freaked Nixon out and they decided to yeah. shut the whole program down because it was a threat to values. In the second <laughs> psychedelic renaissance, it's about microdosing at your Silicon Valley firm to improve your performance. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right, working for Amazon or whatever. Um, now that's a that's glib, right? Because that's not all that's happening. And I have the sneaking suspicion that many of those things are going to end up Trojan horsing the yeah. systems that attempt to co-opt them. <laughs> Probably. You know? But but there are historical instances where it doesn't go that way. You know, uh, I think here of um, the kind of the, the 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 black mark on Zen in World War II in weaponizing modes of meditation to create right? yeah. Rem- remorseless killing, right? Killing without attachment. And oops, right yeah. now they're just humans. The expectation that they're not going to be humans is unreasonable. But even still, again, this is this kind of sorceress descent, right? right. The idea is sometimes these things can be actually co-opted and in a squeezed and limited fashion, they don't always Trojan horses systems. Sometimes they're weaponized. Yeah. And that's so. that the, the implications of that would be rather terrifying to something mm-hmm. like psychedelics. <laughs> so sure. yeah, I and, think we, well, and, and spiritual technologies broadly. Just generally, yeah. But I, yeah. I, we don't have a whole lot. We our corpus of spiritual technologies is modern Western people is relatively small. I mean, like they're present, but they're not really accessed by very many people. I don't think. Yeah, they, I mean, it's not clear to me that they ever were. Yeah. Um, broadly speaking, you know. Yeah, I mean but, that's that's true, but yeah. But think, but yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. There, there's still not like a colloquial a colloquial access. No. And, but I, I, you know, I'm, I am hopeful about, and I think Jung was hopeful too. And Ion, uh, he kind of makes the case that there'll be a return, there'll be a return of meaning in a, in a very kind of a personalistic sense. Um, but that that yeah. takes time. I mean, touching touching on some of the distinctions that you were making between sort of the personal transformation versus the collective or the social transformation, I think that some of the deeper implications of Jung point to this like there is a sickness that rises in the soul that comes from a dissatisfaction with the conscious construction or orientation at the end of the day it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do and you know the fact that he talks about this kind of transformational change over time to me says that probably you know we're going to see a kind of a second coming of meaning as it were but but in a different orientation yeah right this is this is why i'm so kind of interested in and hopeful in the cognitive science approach to meaning because the idea is it's like we can maybe reconcile some of these irreconcilable seemingly irreconcilable and paradoxical features to form a new notion of meaning that restores it within our lives and makes it accessible to people without just trying to like crack open the odometer on the car and roll it backwards to erase the mileage you know, yeah. which is very often the impulse. And I think that it's implicit in Jung, you know, not often foreground, but it's implicit that because the psyche is collective, because projection and transference and counter-transference are operating so broadly, because we have these linkages, these um, sort of hidden, invisible linkages to each other in various ways, individual transformation, in fact, does ripple into collective transformation. Like we really aren't the discrete, in the way that we're not simply individuals, like we're not singular unit of beings, we're community beings. Those communities are maybe not as isolated, right? They're not isolated city states in the way that we think. They have rich, dense interconnections. Like we are made of each other. And so uh, in in the way that you were talking about, right? The, as you said, the, you know, the, 
the self is uh, immortal and imperishable, but the self is a connection, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that actually is heavily implied in, in Jung too, and in the nature of these things. It's not foregrounded and it's hard to understand, but the idea that, that there is a, a level, a scale of analysis that we can look at where we can see these kinds of effects and it isn't just individual um, is um, I think quite important to yeah. sort of interfacing with that work and to me co hopeful. Yeah, I don't see how it could, could be just individual. No. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's a pretty hopeful note to end on. Um, okay. Let's see. Do you have any work that you would like to direct people to? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> the, the PR component. The PR the, component. <laughs> the PR component. The, um, the, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're okay with sharing my uh, link to my YouTube channel, that's okay. always yeah. uh, great for people uh, doing that. Um, I, you know, there is work in progress, which is in like a nebulous state of progress, which is to say that in theory, I, I have been working on, but it hasn't quite consolidated. Um, so I've been working on an extended, an extended series. Um, okay. This was sort of partly inspired by Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, which, which I was somewhat involved with. Uh, and so this idea of trying to sort of lay out the whole of one's you know, argument or something, right, was, was um, uh, something that really struck me. And then I was trying to record this alchemy lecture and it really ran away from me. I know quite a few people have on my channel have seen it, it really ran it. away from me. Yeah, well, so I got to the halfway, like I was like, geez, maybe I should take a break. And I hit the thing and I was like, oh my God, I've been talking for four hours. <laughs> and, then, and then I kind of came back to it and I was like, well, it's going to take me at least another four hours to get through the rest of the stuff that I was thinking. And I was like, actually, no, that's not true. It's going to take me at least two more of those. And I was like, am I going to record two more four hours? This is insane. And so I thought what I should do is restructure this into a series of hour long episodes and be sort of disciplined and release it. So that is sort of been in the works when I'm teaching. So during the regular semester, it's hard to locate the time because I run a I mean, I'm running my private practice and I'm teaching and I'm involved in other projects. Right. Yeah. So finding time is tricky, but um, in theory, at some point, I will start releasing episodes of the series, which has uh, I have dubbed Opus. So Ooh. keep keep eyes on the skies, I guess, for that, okay. uh, which I'm planning because it is evenly subdivisible by three to be a 51 part series. I, I swear it's not just one upmanship of John's okay. numbering. Okay, Anderson. It's just the, it's the, I like the idea of the even division into three. Um, so that's that's one thing. And then I have been assembling notes, writing things, and restructuring in the direction of uh, a book. Uh, so I've, I mean, I've written lots of things, and uh, I write quite a bit of fiction. But I've been looking at sort of a a nonfiction, um, you know. Uh, coalescence of this stuff. Uh, and so the working title on that is uh, Shape Shifting a Practical Guide. So I don't have the faintest okay. idea when that will be coming out uh, because I haven't finished writing it yet. But <clears throat> if people want to go to my YouTube channel, they can get an idea of things. And yeah. Yeah. So that, that sounds like an alluring title. And yeah, I, I recommend all of Anderson's videos there. They're very insightful. And uh, I, I liked that four hour talk you did. It was good. Well, good. Good. I'm glad. Unstructured, but good. It was like it was like young. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which I mean, that's there. You know, there's a reason I like him, but also, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of just meandering through the material at at some level. Yeah. Um, I'm touching on some things, but of course, it was only meant to be the first installment of a thing, and then I was like, wait, this is a crazy way to to do this. Lots of people when they encounter a four hour video are just like, oh hell no. Like, <laughs> I think I watched it in hour bites, so I think you're you're right. prudent in doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's my thought. If it's a somewhat more digestible format, um, that might be a little better for people. But it also helps me to impose um, organizing structures on things that I may foreground some of the connections I'm looking to get at a bit more apparently. And it's something I've become used to doing a bit more as I've released lectures for my courses. So yeah, yeah. we'll see once that, once that starts getting in the pipe, how that goes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have for you. We, we, we went through a lot of different stuff. Yes, we did. It was all very interesting. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. And you're a very companionable person. I appreciate your time. Um, maybe after Opus, we could talk again after I have okay. more things that I've thought of. <laughs> sure. 
yeah, sounds good. Um, no, I thoroughly enjoyed this, and uh, it was a it was a real pleasure talking to you. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to chat again. So by all means, drop me a line. I'd be, all right. I'd be thrilled to do it. Yeah, I appreciate it, Anderson. Okay. All right. Uh, take care. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing this. I never know what these things are like until afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> I don't either. No, it's all it's I've, all just an unconscious flow. And then later I'm like, oh, good. I made sense, I guess. Yeah, I've only done one other one. So I'm still kind of figuring out how I want to format it. I'm kind of I, I think I like the dialectic a little more than like the standard interview. But I don't know what my vision for this is going to be. It's right. Kind of something I'm doing out of interest. Right. But yeah, um, well, I mean, it was good questions and interesting material. And uh, you've actually given me a sort of a bunch of things to think about around the orthodox area. So I seriously, I'm going to have to, I have some stuff. I've done some reading. It's actually something I've been meaning to dig in on. So you've, I think maybe um, uh, given me the impetus to do that, a little bit of inspiration in that direction. Well, awesome. Yeah, it's, yeah. there's so much material that's just not, it's like when Byzantium fell and we got all those strange texts. It's the mm -hmm. same thing. I keep finding books. I'm like, I did not know this existed. And I'd never thought about things these this way before. I just, it's interesting. Right. Treasure trove. But yeah, <laughs> plenty of stuff to do around that. Yeah, uh, I like that. The the uh, uh, donkey carts full of books. Yeah, the donkey carts full of books. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we forget thing. about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, good. All right. Um, so yeah, absolute pleasure. And uh, drop me drop me a line when it's posted up. I'll be I eager will. to I put it and I can cross promote it and stuff too for you. Yes, sir. Appreciate it, okay. Anderson. All right. Have a good Take rest care. of your day. Have a good day. You too.